I'm John Tierman from the Center for International Studies, and welcome on behalf of the Center and the Security Studies Program. Before we begin, I want to and will announce upcoming events, uh, a couple of, of particular interest. One is the Star Forum on Syria. We're having the last U.S. representative, uh, sorry, the last U.S. ambassador, Robert Ford, uh, and a national security advisor on the Middle East, Stephen Simon, uh, when he was uh, in, the, in the Obama administration uh, discussing Syria, and I think they don't agree on Syria, so it should be interesting. It's on Thursday, October 19th at 4.30 in Building 3, Room 270. That's the 19th of October. We also have a uh, what we call a dissident speaker series, a film, uh, Nemtsov, about a Russian dissident uh, who was uh, as, as assassinated, and the filmmaker Vladimir Kara Mirza will be uh, here to speak. That's on October 25th. Uh, in Building 6, Room 120, at 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, and then finally, a, um, a star forum featuring Richard Clark, the former, uh, I don't know what it was he referred to, terrorism czar, I'm not quite sure, that doesn't sound quite right, but he was national security uh, advisor on um, uh, terrorism in the uh, Clinton and Bush administrations, um, and an MIT grad. Uh, we'll be here with our own Joel Brenner, who is a former um, head of counterintelligence for the National Security um, uh, Directorate, and that is on Wednesday, November 1st, 4.30, Building 10, Room 250, 10 250 on the 1st of November. So today we have um, a familiar cast, familiar to us, all MIT professors, uh, to discuss Korea. And they will all go about 15 minutes uh, each, approximately. And then at the end of their remarks, there will be an opportunity to ask questions uh, from these two microphones. So at the end of the remarks, please line up at those microphones and we'll have time for discussion. Um, the uh, three are, and I'll just briefly introduce them because they're easy to find and, and figure out what they're up to today, but they're all in the Security Studies Program and the Department of Political Science. And they are Associate Professor Vipin Narang, who will go first. Uh, Jim Walsh, who's a, a researcher, Senior Research Associate in, in the Security Studies Program. And Taylor Fravel, who is Associate Professor in Political Science and Acting Director uh, of the Center for International Studies. So first, please welcome Vipin Narang. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Is this, everyone hear me? Uh, so what I thought I'd do is uh, set the stage by talking about what was a very uh, exciting and disturbing summer in the North Korean nuclear program. Um, I'm going to walk through basically why the summer was so significant from North Korea's nuclear development program and, no, and their nuclear strategy. Uh, I'm going to say we'll save the tweets and the bluster for question and answer. I don't want to focus on, uh, you know, it's too easy to focus on President Trump's tweets over the weekends, but, you know, it's a weekly affair. Between President Trump, Trump and Kim, uh, it's, been a busy, it's been a busy summer on North Korea. So I'll walk through the capabilities and the strategy, the nuclear strategy that, you know, North Korea has been signaling for a while, um, and some of the achievements uh, that uh, we saw this summer. And uh, then I'll, there's some bad news, 
And then good news uh, in terms of how to deal with North Korea going forward, and that should hopefully set the stage for Jim and Taylor. So North Korea, summer of Hwasong, which is a very bad pun for those who get it. Apparently not. OK. <laughs> so uh, very quickly, you know, the, the, my talk will cover the three Ds of the summer with DPRK. First point, damn, this program is real. They've made a lot of progress in a very short amount of time. An ICBM capability going from a fission to a thermonuclear device or a purported thermonuclear device. We have to believe it's a thermonuclear device. The bad news is that denuclearization is probably now a fantasy. Denuclearization, either it's unlikely that Kim is going to willingly give up his nuclear weapons. And denuclearization by force is an experiment I don't think we want to run. And I can talk a little bit about that. The good news that I'll close with is deterrence can work. We know how to do and practice deterrence. And there's no evidence as of yet that North Korea wants anything besides regime insurance insurance against invasion and disarmament. And we know how to practice and exercise deterrence uh, with other states. We did it with China. We did it with the Soviet Union. All the things we say about Kim now, that he's crazy, that we don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, we said about Mao. And we were able to successfully establish a deterrent regime with China and the Soviet Union. And there's no reason it can't work with North Korea. So I'll, I'll close with that. So we started the summer with you know, when the summer started, it was the disco ball. This is an undated picture of a mock-up of North Korea's fission device. Now, this is a, a device they're trying to signal is on the order of Hiroshima and Nagasaki yields 15 to 20 kilotons, a simple fission device. This picture was released last year, but it's an undated, un undated photo. So we don't know when the mock-up was, uh, you know, when the picture was actually taken. But when it was released, it was North Korea's attempt to signal that they have a fission a compact fission device. And that's important because uh, they were trying to tell the world that they could fit a simple fission device inside a warhead that could be made in a ballistic missile. When you start seeing the, uh, the pictures of the reentry vehicles, it was very clear they were trying to signal that they had developed a compact device. And that was really important because it was uh, designed to signal that they could deliver this fission device with some of the missiles they had already developed and tested. OK, so that's where we are uh, in April, May 2017. Then we start seeing a series of tests of short range systems. This is a multi-rocket launcher system that North Korea has developed and tested. They have several variants of these. Uh, there are several, there, there's the North Korean designation of the Hwasongs, and then the US intelligence community uses the KN designation. There is a family of MRLSs that are designated the KN-19. This is not the KN-19. Uh, they started developing and testing more short-range systems. Why? Because they wanted to be able to hold uh, targets in South Korea at risk, American forces and bases along the Korean Peninsula, US ship assets. So there was, there was a, a test of a, a kind of like a short-range uh, cruise missile for, uh, that was believed to be uh, their version of a ship killer. They did a variety of SCUD tests. The SCUDs are probably the most reliable missile in the North Korean inventory. They're developing maneuverable warheads for the SCUDs, the idea of being able to specifically target US bases in the region. And then we started seeing solid fuel tests, which suggests an advancing program. And the reason why North Korea wants to test solid fuel missiles, anyone know? Why would you want to test solid fuel missiles as opposed to liquid fuel missiles? It's more maneuverable. Easier to have, right. More survivable, more responsive. It takes two to three hours to fuel liquid fuel missiles, and that generates signatures. Otherwise, you have to fuel them horizontally in a shed, which is not the greatest idea. Kim Jong-un smoking next to volatile uh, liquid fuel. Clearly, uh, you know, playing, literally playing with fire. So, we're, we started seeing, this is the Pukasong 2, which is a land-based variant of the, uh, they have a, a canisterized uh, SLBM that they've tested. They're working on another variant. I wouldn't be surprised if that test is coming up soon this fall. But solid fuel systems, which are hard. Casting solid fuel is not easy. So they're trying to, they're trying to signal and work at the same time as they're working. They have these liquid fuel variants for the short range systems. They're trying to develop land and, and, and sh submarine-based or ship-based solid fuel missiles as well to enhance survivability. It's a small peninsula. They know we're watching them. 
All of this enhances responsiveness and survivability. This program is for real. Everyone know what this is? 12. This is the, uh, there are two major uh, developments in the intermediate range and ICBM range uh, class for North Korea's uh, missile development program. This is the Hwasong-12. They were playing around with the Musadans uh, earlier in the year and seemed to have chucked it in favor for uh, the Hwasong-12, which is liquid fuel, intermediate range ballistic missile, which can target, what's the most important target for the Hwasong-12? Guam. Guam. Because that's where Anderson Air Force Base is. And Kim has signaled his intention uh, and, and irritation with the B-1 bombers that come out of Guam. He calls them the Air Pirates of Guam. And so the Hwasong-12 is really important in North Korean nuclear strategy because it puts Guam within range and is becoming more reliable. The first stage of the Hwasong-12 provides the basis for the Hwasong-14, which is the ICBM. The ICBM was tested twice, July 4th, Happy Independence Day, and uh, a couple weeks later on July 28th. The Hwasong-14 is believed to be a two-stage system. First stage in, in the engines on the Hwasong-14 and 12 are believed to be similar, if not the same. We can talk about the design and maybe the help that they have gotten in the past on design basis. It's now believed they can produce the engines themselves, as well as the fuel themselves, which means the program is becoming more uh, diversified and indigenous. They can build the missiles themselves. They can build the nuclear weapons and manufacture the nuclear weapons themselves, which means sanctions make it very difficult to slow down the program. So the Hwasong-14 is important because it can start putting the US homeland at risk. At least, you know, estimating the range on the Hwasong-14 is difficult because it depends on the payload. So depending on the weight of the reentry vehicle, you know, the ranges, the upper, the upper limit on the Hwasong-14 range, David Wright in, here at Cambridge estimated to be somewhere around 10,500 kilometers, which would put at least Chicago in range with a 1,000 kilogram warhead, a one ton warhead. If they cannot deliver a fission or thermonuclear device to the US homeland yet, we have to assume that they soon will be. From a policy perspective, we have to assume that they can. We don't know for sure, though. And then came September 3rd, 150 kilotons, universal language. Uh, seismic signature of 6.2, I think, was the final uh, uh, Richter scale uh, reading on the test. Uh, and the, it's, it's been notoriously difficult to estimate the yield of the underground test because of the geology at the Pungyeri uh, um, test site. Uh, but we know that this was a big test. And there are going to be debates about, we don't know what they tested. On the day before, the day of the test, they released this picture of the mock-up of what is clearly, you know, they're trying to signal as a two-stage thermonuclear device with a primary, the fission primary igniting uh, a, a secondary comprised of fusion fuel. But we don't know if this is what they tested. They could have tested a boosted fission device. They could have tested, uh, a, you know, a a compact thermonuclear device. Maybe they test a thermonuclear device that was much bigger. This is designed to signal that it can fit in the reentry vehicle of a ballistic missile. But we don't know what they tested on September 3rd, but this is what they want to signal that they, you know, uh, what, they, what they did test. 150 kilotons, 200 kilotons, it could be consistent with a boosted fission device. It could be consistent with a two-stage thermonuclear device. So there'll be debates about this. And we weren't able to, at least in the open source, get um, <laughs> Uh, you know, radionucleides in the, in, the, in the air after the test to be able to distinguish between the two. Maybe the intelligence communities have been able to. But if they don't have a two-stage device now, we have to assume that they will get there like most nuclear states. It takes some time to get there, five to seven years after you test a fission device. But this is important because the larger the yield, the less accurate the ICBM has to be. And the, this is clearly for the Hwasong-14. Uh, in, in, at 150 kilotons plus, you know, you can jack up the yield by putting more fusion fuel in, but it really doesn't matter where the Hwasong-14 hits in a city, it's like which half of the city do you want to lose? So the bigger the yield, the less accurate the missiles have to be. And this fits and completes what North Korea has signaled is its nuclear strategy from earlier this year and previous years as well. And they sprinted in the last several months to fill out their entire nuclear strategy, which I've called in my... Uh, my own work, asymmetric escalation. And this looks very much like NATO strategy 
during the Cold War, Pakistani strategy now against India. The short range missiles are designed to hold targets in the peninsula, Japan, Okinawa, Guam, which is out here, at risk. And that's what the short and inter intermediate range ballistic missiles are. The Hwasong-12 was really important because it started putting Guam in reach. The theory of survival that Kim Jong-un has, he acquired nuclear weapons to deter an American-led invasion of regi or regime change. And the idea is he can't survive the conventional onslaught unless he degrades allied ability to support the conventional attack against him, which is why being able to hold Guam at risk is important. Being able to hold American bases in Japan and South Korea are important. But then the question is, how do you deter American nuclear retaliation, your smaller force? How do you deter, you know, use nuclear weapons against Guam? America is going to annihilate you, right? Well, that's why the ICBM is so important. The American uh, deterrence calculation changes. This and these targets are. This is from the map is from the Washington Post, but it was a. Uh, an, um, based on the so-called map of doom that was released that targeted, that showed targets on the US homeland uh, after a North Korean missile test, uh, San Diego, which is important because of the Seventh Fleet, uh, Whiteman Air Force Base, Nebraska, Washington DC, and then Barksdale Air Force Base. These were the targets that were indicated, but they've also shown San Francisco in videos. They've also shown New York. Haven't shown Boston yet, but we go before New York, I imagine. And we have to assume that the bulk of the American continental United States include, and Hawaii are all potentially at risk to at least a fission device, because it's probably a lighter uh, warhead and reentry vehicle. Uh, and if not now, probably someday the thermonuclear device as well. Right? So the North Korean nuclear strategy is we have to degrade the American ability to, deter, uh, to sustain the conventional attacks. We have to use nuclear weapons to generate a pause in the conventional attack. They use a nuclear weapon in the theory as the world comes to a screeching halt, and the allies will stop their attack on Kim Jong-un. And they deter American nuclear retaliation by, by being able to hold American cities at risk. And so the ICBM is not designed to be a first use weapon, according to this theory. It is to be able to deter the American nuclear retaliation against it. And so that's why the ICBM is so important in North Korean nuclear strategy. And it's not irrational. I wrote an article in the Washington Post saying that you know, this is, a, this is a, a rational nuclear strategy because it's, it's exactly what we had in the early Cold War. It's exactly what Pakistan has against India. It's not irrational. It's risky, but it's not irrational. So the bad news is that given how far North Korea has come, the estimates on the North Korean nuclear inventory are upwards of 60 nuclear warheads according to the Defense Intelligence Agency. And that means or suggests that they probably have blended pits uh, and a growing inventory of fission and potentially thermonuclear devices. So denuclearization is probably a fantasy at this point. The reason US non-proliferation policy has spent so much time trying to stop states like Iraq and Libya from acquiring nuclear weapons is because once they acquire them, it becomes very difficult for states to convince states to give them up. There's only been one state that's willing, willingly given up nuclear weapons over which they had sovereign control. Anyone know which one? South, South Africa. Africa. We can talk about Ukraine, but South Africa is pretty much the only case. And South Africa was different for a lot of reasons. So at this point, what incentive does Kim have to give up nuclear weapons? He saw what happened to Gaddafi and Saddam once they did. So convincing Kim to give up nuclear weapons willingly seems like it, you know, that horse has left the barn. Denuclearization by force is the other option. And this is what you know, President Trump has referred to at some, and, and General Mattis at some point also, uh, you know, effectively a counterforce strike against the North Korean nuclear arsenal. It's small, but there's the intelligence problem. Can you get them all? Do you know how many they have in the first place? Do you know where they are in real time? Once you start going after them, how do you avoid North Korea using a nuclear weapon? In the process, they've probably designed their command and control to account for this possibility to deter decapitation and counterforce strikes against it. So we have to assume, whether it's true or not, but we have to assume, unless you want South Korea or Japan or Guam to eat a nuclear weapon, that they've designed their, designed their command and control to fail deadly and not fail safe. It would be rational for them to do that. Remember, North Korea has a small arsenal, and new nuclear states with small arsenals often have very itchy trigger fingers because they don't know how long their 
arsenal will survive in a conventional counterforce attack against it. It's what's known colloquially as the use it or lose it dilemma. North Korea has to use its nuclear weapons before it loses them if it's their only hope of survival. So denuclearization, especially in this phase, by force, is a very, very risky proposition. And it's not an experiment I would suggest we try to run. So that's the bad news. There is some good news, and then I'll close. Deterrence can work. We know how to practice deterrence. We are, the United States is the most conventionally powerful state in the system. It has the most sophisticated and largest and diverse nuclear arsenal and responsive nuclear arsenal in the world. We know how to practice deterrence against new and emerging nuclear states and established nuclear states like the Soviet Union, Russia, and China. There's no reason it can't work with North Korea. There's no evidence that North Korea wants to reunify the peninsula on its terms yet. North Korea acquired nuclear weapons to deter an American or allied attack against it. And the reality is once a state acquires a nuclear capability, it's bought itself that insurance. But we can still practice deterrence. There's the argument, oh, Kim's crazy. Nothing he's done suggests he's not means and rational. Everything he's done this summer suggests, suggests he's means and rational. And we said it about Mao. But we were able to practice deterrence with China. Uh, it's not a perfect solution. There are always risks we run. But right now, Kim is actually probably, we can talk about some of the clever uh, deterrent threats that Kim has made over the summer. I think the Guam enveloping threat was really clever. He's very clearly signaling he did not like the B-1 bomber runs out of, Gu out of Anderson Air Force Base. And uh, because they give him an itchy trigger finger, that's going to be the, the B-1 flights are, he believes, they're not nuclear capable. He believes they are. He, they would be part of, he, ho he believes, any uh, potential surprise attack against him. And so we, when we run up against the North Korean military airspace with the B-1 bombers, it makes North Korea really, really itchy and wary of US intentions. And so the, the, there was a very clever deterrent threat that he was trying to issue with the Guam enveloping threat in, uh, in August. And he's done it again. The, the threat you know, to uh, shoot down B-1 bombers or shoot at B-1 bombers as they approach North Korean airspace are very clearly trying to signal that these irritate and scare North Korea. We, on the other hand, have not been practicing deterrence particularly well because there's a lot of confusion in the administration. There is not one voice. The advantage that Kim has is he's single voice. He's not undermined by uh, you know, his cabinet. Or in this case, the cabinet is not undermined by the president. <laughs> but deterrence requires several features. I learned from the best, Professor Scott Sagan here, the four C's of deterrence. I didn't get all of them here, but capability, there are five C's, I think. Capability, North Korea has it, we have it. But clarity, consistency, coherence, and communication. We have been unclear about what precisely we are trying to deter North Korea from doing. Are we trying to deter Kim from making out outlandish threats? Are we trying to deter them from testing missiles? Are we trying to deter them from testing nuclear weapons? Are we trying to deter them from attacking South Korea? It is completely unclear. And at various points, the president and, and the cabinet have said various things that undermine each other. And it is an ambiguity. There's an argument, ambiguity enhances deterrence. That's true. But the enemy of deterrence is confusion. And right now, we have massive confusion among the administration. So we need to tighten our message and be consistent and coherent and clear about what it is we want. There's also the issue of communication. Deterrence requires credibly communicating a threat that if you do x, I will do y. But we have, so Secretary Tillerson says we have several channels open to North Korea, which we do. And then at the same time, President Trump says we shouldn't be negotiating with them. You always have to keep channels of communication open in order to issue uh, and, and issue very clear threats about what it is and lines about what it is you don't want your adversary doing. And we know how to do that. So deterrence requires dialogue and communication. And to say we're not going to have any communication just for, uh, you know, for crisis management purposes also, to avoid miscalculation and the, and, the, and, and the risk of war by miscalculation, which is right now, I think, probably the biggest risk of conflict breaking out, we need to have those channels open. Uh, and so we can do this, and we're not doing a very good job at the moment, but it doesn't mean that we can't get uh, the message right and a strategy. Secretaries Mattis and Tillerson out outlined a very clear, and I thought, 
smart strategy in the Wall Street Journal. But if the president isn't on board with that strategy, it's just a proposal. Until the president gets on board with a strategy of deterrence uh, and uh, you know, that you can, denuclearization is off the table, but we can still practice deterrence, then the cabinet is still, I think, reaching for, you know, we're in a state of confusion until he, they can convince the president that this is a viable strategy. So I'll stop there and I look forward to questions. Now turn it over to Jim. Good afternoon, friends. Oh, let me turn on the mic. I probably don't need a mic. That's what some people would say. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for taking time out. It's the end of the day, and you're still here to do more. I'm uh, honored to be with my distinguished colleagues and learn from them every day, and I expect I'll learn from you in question and answer. Um, what I'll be doing is looking briefly at three things. One, sort of putting this in a political context. Uh, or uh, historical context, just very briefly. I'll uh, quickly review some of the options, uh, some that Vipin did not mention. And then, you know, let's face it, most of you are here because you want to uh, address this question. Are we going to have a war? Right? Is that not the most important question that we face? And so I'll spend a little bit of time on that. But let's begin. Let's see. Oh, dear. There we go. Or not. Where, where should I point it? Maybe I should put it there. I'm pushing the wrong one. Oh, that one. How many of you are here or are from MIT or affiliate? Then you all know the big secret that the rest of the world doesn't know is that our technology sucks. You know that. <laughs> So let's start with the, some, some basics. I mean, we sort of are leaping into what are the capabilities and what are the dangers. But we might also ask ourselves the question, why is it that North Korea behaves the way that it does? And maybe if we understand our adversary, we would be able to design better policies to deal with it. So let's take a history lesson here. People always talk about North Korea and China. And there's a lot of talk about China. But who is North Korea's most important, historically speaking, most important ally? It's Russia. It was Russia that founded North Korea, not China. And other than the founding of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the second most important date in North Korean history is the collapse of the Soviet Union. In breathtaking speed, they lost their main economic uh, ally, their one that gave them aid, uh, that uh, gave them trade. There's a lot of trade between North Korea and the COCOM countries of, the, of Eastern Europe. That all goes away, as well as the security umbrella that the, uh, Russia, that the Soviets had supplied to them, as you had the standoff during the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. Uh, and any time something sort of rose to the level of crisis. Let's say if North Korea attempts to assassinate a South Korean president or shoots down a civilian airliner, those crises would be tamped down because neither superpower wanted to see them escalate to the point of full-blown global nuclear war. Well, that umbrella, in addition to all the economic foundation for North Korea, goes away very quickly. And of course, North Korea quickly descends into famine in the early and uh, to mid-1990s. And while this is happening, while you've lost your most important ally, your erstwhile friends are cozying up to your enemy, your sworn enemy. Uh, the Russians recognize, you know, under uh, uh, Yeltsin, the Russians are signing trade agreements with the South Koreans, recognizing South Korean. The Chinese are doing the same. So you are sinking like a rock, and your friends are embracing your enemy. And then, of course, uh, uh, that only exacerbates, and by the way, this is a picture I took when I was in the DPRK. And when I was there, what they told me, what did the North Koreans tell me? They said, we are a mouse surrounded by elephants. Japan is a great power. The US is a great power. Russia is a great power. China is a great power. And we are alone. We are alone, and we are in it. So while nuclear weapons would not have been the strategy I would have advised to them at the time, it's not uh, completely irrational that if you think you're alone, that you can't trust any great power, that you think the Chinese 
and the U.S. are going to cut a deal and leave you to hang out to dry, then you're probably going to look for alternatives. Let's took, uh, talk a little bit about these. Is, this is a bit outdated, but it's uh, CSIS's list of um, um, missile and nuclear tests. And I put it up there because I think it's pretty striking, or at least two features of it are striking. I just finished talking about sort of how do we situate North Korea in a regional security context, and, and what are the, the problems they face. And so that's really sort of a structural explanation for why they behave. But it's pretty clear that as you go from one leader to the next to the next, there is big variation here. And basically, with the arrival of the young Chairman Kim, you see a dramatic, dramatic increase in missile and uh, nuclear testing. And so I would say that leads me to conclude that uh, while the structural features are important, leadership matters, personalities matter, Kim matters. And we'll have to see if Mr. Trump matters. The other thing that strikes me about this is this. What the hell is going on there? Because test, 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 and then that. That, my friends, is the agreed framework. That was a diplomatic agreement in which the North Koreans agreed to dismantle their plutonium reactor and stop producing bomb material and to suspend long-range missile tests. Not bad, if you ask me, to get that for eight years. You know, and I wouldn't mind having a little a bit of that over here. But when people, and we'll get to this in a minute, when we talk about diplomacy, you often say, well, it's dismissed uh, because you can't talk to them or they cheat or whatever. I will say that there are, we have actual historical evidence that sometimes nonproliferation agreements actually advance our security. So let me talk a few minutes about options. Sanctions. This is uh, America's favorite foreign policy tool, bar none on Capitol Hill, but everywhere. If you are Russians and you do bad things, sanctions. You know, if you're Libya and you do bad things, sanctions. Uh, you know, what, for every conceivable issue, uh, that I don't like you because you're wearing orange and I hate orange, sanctions. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that while they are quite attractive for a variety of reasons, uh, they are not the, the answer to our problem. Uh, first of all, as the uh, panel of experts, the UN panel of experts for uh, North Korea has amply documented and documents every year, uh, North Korea is not the priority for us that it is for some other countries. And some of these countries, modestly, uh, countries with modest infrastructure or developing countries, really don't put DPRK enforcement of sanctions as their number one top national security priority. And instead, you know, they're sort of enforced by some and not enforced by others. Uh, in addition, I just think there are some structural issues here. You know, the U.S. is a very, very lucky place. We have, we are bordered by two big oceans, and I, uh, with apologies to Canadians and Mexicans in the room, two big, friendly, weak neighbors. It's a great deal. <laughs> you know, you know what's not a great deal? Poland. Poland is not a great deal, uh, where you're stuck between uh, Germany and Russia. Tibet, also not a really great deal. But who comes in number two? I'm going to say it's North Korea, right? Because you have a Stalinist uh, sclerotic uh, system, but you are smack dab sharing three provinces 800 kilometers with the biggest growing economy in the world. You don't have to do a lot right just to benefit from sitting next to China. And in a world in which we have globalization, you know, where uh, production is decentralized and there are lines of manufacturing logistics that are, go from one place to another, that's great if you want to beat sanctions. That's an awesome, awesome combination. Be next to a really, really rich, growing country in a world of globalization. So I think we face some structural issues. I also think there's a disconnect here. Yes, we can impose costs on the North Koreans. We can do that. But at, uh, the question here is timing. I think they've demonstrated, as that previous chart should have made clear, they can build missiles and test nuclear weapons faster than we can impose sanctions that would matter, right? We pass a sanction, yay, we're great. Well, they've already had four tests since you've done that. And so we are losing that race. I don't think that's a race we're going to win. And then I do worry, I worry, and my colleague at Harvard, John Park, and I have written a study uh, about North Korea sanctions where we interviewed 
North Korean defectors who worked for state trading companies. These are the businessmen and women whose job is to beat sanctions. And I worry that we can squeeze and we can cut off things, but at the end of the day, in this society, I think uh, Chairman Kim and the military, they're gonna get the last gallon of gasoline and they're gonna get the last bowl of rice. And the people who are gonna lose it first are those uh, women and young children, not on, the prov not on the border provinces and not in Pyongyang, but who live in the countryside that my humanitarian relief friends tell me live in food insecurity. They will be the ones who will pay the price first. And so I do think there's some ethical issues here that one has to struggle with. And then finally, uh, the North Koreans, what, what the main takeaway from our study is the, the adversary gets a vote. This is an iterative game. The North Koreans, we impose sanctions. The North Koreans just don't sit there and not do anything. They respond. They do countermeasures. And we keep doing the same thing over and over again. Same song, different verse, a little louder. And they innovate and get around our previous sanctions. And so some of the things they've done is, in the old days, they used to send a North Korean business person or official over across the border for a day, sign some deals, come back to North Korea. They have now embedded in China. They've taken their families, their children go to Chinese schools. They're like any expatriate business community. They have embedded in China. And more importantly, who's doing the procurement? It's not the North Koreans. It's the Chinese firms they pay to do the procurement. So if you're a European company with a manufacturing line in China, you want to sell stuff, and a Chinese client comes up and says, I want to buy X widgets, you think you're ch selling to a Chinese client. No, uh, two days later, that's ending up in Pyongyang. So they have essentially bought the services of, who, of traders who are far more sophisticated than they did. We found that actually what happened was, as we imposed sanctions, the cost of doing business because of risk went up for the North Koreans. They responded to that risk by monetizing it, paid fatter commission fees, and as a result, drew more sophisticated Chinese partners. They got better. So I'm not a big believer that sanctions are going to solve this problem. All right, I'm going to have to give this to Vipin again. Tech man. <laughs> yeah, maybe I just have to do it manually. Yeah, let's talk a minute and Vip and touch on this so I won't spend too much time on it. It's preventive war. You know, you, you, so I just want to understand what you're saying here when you're arguing for preventive war. We're going to attack a nuclear weapon state. We're going to attack a country that possesses nuclear weapons. Normally, that has not what we have cho you know, we've chosen to do. We've waged preventive war. The Israelis have waged preventive war, other states. But we have tended to avoid attacking a country that already has nuclear weapons for obvious reasons. And as Vipin says, we don't know if we're going to get everything. And certainly, the North Koreans know we're thinking about it. God knows we talk enough about it. I'm guessing that they're probably preparing for that. And they have thousands of artillery tubes pointed at Seoul, a city of 20 million people. And, and let me jump a little bit and remind you, we, you heard Lindsey Graham say, well, let's fight them over here rather than fighting them here. There are 30,000 US troops and their families in Seoul, plus thousands more American civilians. There are 80,000 troops in Japan, thousands more. We are there. If that war happens, we're not fighting it in San Antonio, we're not fighting it in Seattle, but we're fighting it in Seoul, and we have lots of people at risk, as well as the 13th largest economy, a treaty ally, uh, a city of more than 20 million people. So if we go after them, I'm pretty sure those artillery troops, maybe they're old, maybe they're, they don't all work, maybe we can get to them with counter battery, but they're going to drop a lot of explosive on Seoul. And I do think that there's a question of ethics here. You know, a preventive war is a war of choice. It's not a war of necessity. You're deciding, well, I just don't like the capabilities that this sovereign state has, so I'm going to kill a bunch of people for it. And while international law permits preemptive attacks if you think an attack on you is imminent, it's not so kindly about the idea of just deciding to up and kill millions of people because you don't like the other country's capabilities. Let's talk about diplomacy. I'm old school. I say, hold your friends close and your enemies closer. We should be constantly talking to them, if only for intel reasons, if only to get a better bead on what they're thinking and how they're feeling. But no, we don't have diplomatic relations. We don't talk to them very often. We think of diplomacy as a reward. If you're nice to us, we'll talk to you. We didn't have that view towards the Soviet Union. 
We had diplomatic relations with a country that had 20,000 nuclear weapons aimed at our cities. Why? Because it was in our national security interest. That's why. That was the lesson of the Cuban Missile Crisis. You better damn well talk to those people who can do you harm. So I'm a proponent of uh, 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 diplomacy, and I think it's been successful. Got Otto Wambier home, and I, as you know, I think the agreed framework was a success. And it helps keep our partners on board. You know, the Chinese want us to, we want the Chinese to do a bunch of things. Well, maybe we should do some things that they're interested in to keep them on board. Now, there are difficulties. It takes two or four or six, depending on what you're talking about in the Korean context, to tango. They did cheat on the agreed framework. We did not keep all our promises either, so the record there is not perfect. Uh, and it's a murderous regime. But again, the more murderous and the more dangerous, it seems to me, the more reason to be talking. So the final question that everyone's interested in, I'm going to get a bit of water here, is there going to be war? This is the dramatic parse, pause part. <laughs> well, I want to start with the good news. And Vipin pointed this out. No one wants a war, so why would we get a war? The North Koreans know they're going to lose. They will absolutely lose. And it's the end of their regime if there's a war. And if there's one thing the Kims want, it's they want to hold on to power. Certainly China and South Korea don't want a war on their own backyard uh, with all the implications that has. I think the U.S. doesn't want a war. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> Big wars are rare. You know, we don't fight the Korean War in World War I and World War II every day. The, the, you know, big, nasty, ugly wars low probability event. We have someone in the audience who has spent a lot of time on high consequence, low probability events. This is one of them. And I would say inadvertent war, a war that when you get war even though no one wants war, that's even more rare than purposive war. So there's the good news. But of course you knew that there was bad news, didn't you? You knew that was coming? Because I think you can get inadvertent war. You can get war even when people don't want war. As Vipin said, there's lots of bluster and bluffing where people make threats they don't mean. So when you want to make a threat that you do mean, is your adversary actually going to know that you're serious about it this time? We have contradictory signaling, poor lines of communication, inexperienced leadership, poor understanding of the adversary. News reports are that the North Koreans are trying to consult with Republicans to try to understand Donald Trump. On the one hand, good luck with that, and I support you on that. But two, that probably means that they feel like they don't understand him. That's what that means, if, if that's true. And, and we have, the South Koreans have an escalatory doctrine. You know, their, their military doctrine is leaning forward. And they have a public policy of decapitation. Now, I'm all in favor, if you're a military person, you, have, you want options for everything. And yes, you probably want to have a decapitation option. But you don't want to put it in your defense white paper and talk about it a lot. <laughs> that we have big, robust plans that we're going to hit you in a surprise attack, you weaker adversary. And I worry about constraints. With Kim, you know, there's a higher rate of pur purging than with his father. Uh, and you wonder if there's going to be a sort of Saddam before the Kuwait war thing, where with a lot of purging, who is it in the room that's going to tell Chairman Kim that what he just said is a bad idea? Who's going to raise his hand and say, boss, I think you're wrong? I don't, uh, I think that's a permissive environment for mistakes. And one might say, based on some things that have happened in the administration, for example, having a speech vetted before the UN and then changing it the day after, after it's all been approved and inserting lots of language you were warned by the CIA and your national security advisor not to include, I, there may be some issues there too. And of course the personalities of the leaders. So those are conditions, don't, don't, those don't give you probabilities. But it, 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 I would say that that's a cause, for, that, that's a whole lot of them all in one place. So, but Jim, if Kim knows he's going to lose, why would he fight? And I would say there's a difference between general deterrence and crisis stability. If we finally f find ourselves in a crisis where uh, uh, the part, one or both of the parties think now that the likelihood of war has increased, they think something might actually happen, and then the incentives begin to shift. If Kim thinks that an attack is imminent, he does have, as Vipin has said, I think, uh, could conceivably b believe that he has an incentive to strike first. He's overmatched. He knows it. 
it, 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 the clock is ticking when he thinks something has started. Maybe they're coming after me. I've got five minutes, half an hour to decide, or I might lose my military assets. So that puts a lot of time pressure on a guy who already might be thinking that we're coming after him. And they can't fight a long war, so they really would need to escalate with the hope of sort of cutting it off before things got really, really bad. Now, why would Kim think we would attack him? Because we keep saying that over and over again. <laughs> and because South Korea has a policy of decapitation. And those flights that Vipin uh, referenced, so we had stealthy flights, which I'm guessing the North Koreans did not see, but read about in the paper. So what's their conclusion? We can't see them. They want to come and hit us. We don't know when that's going to come. There's a crisis. I hear my, there's, there's a report that something's happened. Itchy trigger finger. So, I, oh, I, I went too fast to that. So again, though, the fundamentals here are war doesn't happen, big wars don't happen very often. Inadvertent wars are even less likely. At the end of the day, I think we can take solace that this is still an unlikely event. It's still unlikely because people don't want to commit suicide. But I would remind you that improbable events do happen. They just happen less often. And certainly you could say that about an election that was held last year. But for those of you who are from Massachusetts, there is probably a more salient example that the Patriots' in-game probability of losing the Super Bowl with two minutes left was 92%. In social science, that's considered truth. 92%. And, that the, and yet they won. So I think a lot of us think, oh, 90% chance something isn't going to happen. That means it's impossible. No, it doesn't. It is possible. It happens one out of 10 times. So the big picture. I've spent most of my career, or a good part of my career, battling threat hypers, uh, people who exaggerate threats, uh, uh, saying the US faces all sorts of things, and the, you know, particularly the ones that do it out of ideology or for possibly for financial gain. I think, in general, we're a very safe country. And we get our, sometimes our worst enemy is ourselves, often our worst enemy is ourselves, as the most powerful country on the planet. But I am more worried than I have been before. And, the th and, and I don't know what the probability is. I could not assign a number to it. The thing about the Patriots game, we had tons of data. We had film on every player, film on every game, film on every coach. The betting markets had a tremendous amount of information. They were, there were huge amounts, millions of dollars were at stake. People worked this hard, and that was still the outcome. We don't know anything. And that uncertainty uh, gnaws at me. And it makes me more nervous. And so I think this at no point, I can think of no point in my lifetime, maybe since the mid-1990s, that war with uh, Korea was more, seemed more likely. But of course, in 1994, North Korea didn't have nuclear weapons. So do I think it's going to happen? No. Am I worried? Yes. So I'll stop there. Unlike my dear colleagues, I won't be using any PowerPoint, so there'll be no technological failures before we get started. You were smart. Um, but I am going to set a timer because I realize some of you probably will want to uh, ask questions. I'll try to be brief. Um, my uh, purpose here today is to talk about uh, China's role. Uh, and there's sort of a fourth option, I guess, that Jim and Vipin didn't talk about for dealing with uh, North Korea, which is China, you deal with it. Right? That seems to be uh, the president's uh, initial reaction. It was probably the consensus in Washington that if only the Chinese would step up and do more, then the problem would be solved. So um, I want to go through three questions about China's role. Uh, why uh, is China not doing more? Um, what is it, in fact, doing? And will it change? Uh, so let me start with the first question. Why China's uh, not uh, doing more? either to halt the pace of testing or to uh, achieve denuclearization. I think there are four uh, main reasons. Uh, the first is geostrategic. When China looks out at um, the problem in North Korea, it sees it through the sort of geography of the Korean Peninsula. And there are three sort of 
stylized futures. The peninsula could be uh, reunified under Seoul and uh, remain allied with the United States uh, with US troops uh, on the peninsula uh, adjacent to China. It could be uh, unified but neutral and effectively under a Chinese sphere of influence, or it could remain in its current state, which is divided between North and South. Now, it's unlikely that China would be unified uh, and neutral, uh, sorry, that uh, the Korea Peninsula would be unified and neutral under Chinese, uh, and then sort of under a Chinese sphere of influence. I can't see Seoul or Washington uh, moving in that direction, um, which means that China is sort of stuck between choosing between a divided peninsula or one that's united under um, an American uh, alliance and umbrella. And so uh, the main reason, I think, why China doesn't uh, push so hard in terms of sanctions or other pressure that it might apply, it trades tremendously with North Korea, its biggest trading partner by far, so it has a lot of latent leverage that it could use, is because it doesn't want to bring about uh, the collapse of North Korea and thus a, a Korea that is unified uh, by or under Seoul and allied with the United States. So the status quo is preferable to the alternative. I, mean, I, I, I think a lot of it just boils down to, to that simple uh, calculation. And Kim, I think, knows this. And so he's, he can actually sort of push China pretty hard because he knows ultimately they're not going to come down uh, that hard on I mean, they, They've given him so much. He's given them so many opportunities to apply pressure or to apply greater pressure, which, uh, which they have not uh, pursued. The second reason just has to do with more general fears of instability on the peninsula. This could be brought about by sort of an internal collapse of the regime, whether or not that's a result of, of U.S. sanctions or somehow uh, uh, occurs for other factors. China worries greatly about uh, the flow of refugees from North Korea into China. Why? Because there are lots of ethnic Koreans who are Chinese citizens who reside right across the border. And China is a multi-ethnic state, although 92% of the population roughly is Han Chinese, 8% of the population is not. And most of that 8% lives in border regions. And China, Chinese leaders worry a lot about maintaining the territorial integrity of this multi-ethnic state. Uh, a massive influx of Korean refugees into a Korean dominant area of China would, I think, create internal instabilities in China that they would prefer to avoid. Uh, and likewise, if the regime in, in, sort of in Pyongyang appeared as if it was collapsing, there'd be great uncertainty in, in China about what the future would look like. Uh, and China might believe it would have to risk great actions to maintain its interests, and they would prefer, prefer not to have to make those choices. So keeping uh, uh, North Korea alive, uh, allowing it to prosper uh, economically and to actually consolidate it, it is in uh, Chinese interest. And the second main reason why I think they don't uh, push as hard as many would like China to push. Uh, the third one uh, actually has to do with legitimacy and the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. Because there are only four other communist-led uh, countries in the world. North Korea is one of them. Uh, China is trying very hard to prove some sort of model by which uh, a communist party can stay in power even if it sort of tries to harness market forces. And so the collapse of any more uh, communist uh, countries uh, in uh, the world would actually, I think, uh, be a great concern for Chinese leaders as they're trying to uh, protect and maintain uh, their, their own model. And so China works hard to keep the other communist countries alive. And despite all the territorial disputes that it has with Vietnam, for example, China never pushes Vietnam that hard because it's always trying to keep uh, in power that uh, faction of the Vietnamese leadership that wants to maintain good ties with China for the same reason, because they're trying to ensure the survival of the Workers' Party uh, in, in Vietnam. The second reason has to do with the Korean War. Now, Jim said, okay, who was Russia's, who was, you know, uh, North Korea's great ally? Uh, it was Russia, but who, who, who paid in blood and treasure to keep North Korea alive? It wasn't Russia. Uh, it was China, right? Hundreds of thousands of Chinese died in the Korean War to keep North Korea independent and sovereign. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese were killed or wounded in the Korean War. Ten times the number of, at least ten times the number of Americans, right? So they paid a heavy price. Uh, in their own history, in, in China's own history, uh, victory in the Korean War over the Americans is, is something that they um, uh, discussed routinely. Now, of course, it wasn't really a victory, but the fact that they fought a much stronger power to a stalemate was a victory of sorts uh, at the time. And so it just seems to be very hard within the highest levels of the Communist Party to decide that now is the time to abandon the country that you fought to uh, keep alive and paid a high price for. The fourth reason has to do with China's own beliefs about nuclear weapons. I think China believes that the North <coughs> Koreans are developing nuclear weapons for perfectly reasonable reasons, right? Uh, to keep their country sovereign and independent. 
uh, and to defend against the potential attacks from the United States. This is exactly the same reason why China developed nuclear weapons. So Vipin mentioned, oh, we've got lots of experience uh, deterring uh, uh, China, so therefore we can deter Korea. It's also true, uh, or the flip side is also true, right? China has worked very hard to be in a position where it can deter the United States from using nuclear weapons against China first. And it took China a lot longer than it's taking North Korea. Uh, but be that as it may, I think China looks at the situation and says, yeah, you know, it's not bad for North Korea to have nuclear weapons, given that they want the re regime uh, in North Korea to survive. Uh, it, it's probably, it, it, it is an insurance policy and one in which they can uh, see in their own history. So if you look at, you know, why China hasn't done more since you know, the first test in 2006. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the Chinese believe the North has perfectly good reasons for developing uh, nuclear weapons. Um, so second question, what is China doing? You know, China does just enough to appear to be doing something, but not, a, not so much that it will bring about uh, serious political change in Pyongyang, right? So it's their min-max approach. Um, uh, the minimum that they can do to demonstrate that maximally somehow they're actually taking action. But it's never, never that much. It's never what um, uh, Washington uh, would like or others who would like to uh, tighten pressure on the North uh, would like. Uh, China's not going to go so far as to uh, bring, uh, to, to implement sanctions on its own that are so widespread and so robust that it would you know, have the possibility of bringing about the collapse of the regime and thus having the regime um, Pyongyang think twice about uh, its nuclear program. So China's not going to halt oil. They might tweak the oil now and again to express displeasure. They might even reduce it somewhat, but they're not going to halt it. Uh, if you look at trade patterns over the last seven years, you know, it, it's, it's grown quite substantially, which I think um, um, points, to, points to the limits that China, China would place economically. Now China's policy is for a dual freeze. So this would be a freeze of, uh, can, uh, freeze of the DPRK nuclear program in exchange for a freeze of US ROK exercises. This is complete uh, effort to deflect any responsibility away from China onto the United States because who would have to make the first move here? Would, you know, Washington would have to signal that it would no longer continue exercises with an ally that it's had for uh, decades. Um, so, so, so that's not a non-starter. What China's not doing, for example, is emphasizing uh, the goal of denuclearization from the September 2005 agreement in the six-party talks. Of course, this was before the first nuclear test, but it is an agreement that China helped bring about uh, and, and is one goal that many people would like to see is de denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So, so China's really just focused at a tactical level uh, diplomatically and, and the sort of more general exhortations to pursue a diplomatic approach. Um, but that makes sense if you buy my argument as to why uh, uh, they, they, they don't want to do more for geopolitical reasons, legitimacy reasons, and so forth. Third question is, will China's approach change? I think it's unlikely to change substantially, but there have been some very interesting signs in the last couple of years, and in fact, in the last few months, that there is certainly a great debate going on within Beijing uh, among scholars and uh, informed scholars and informed analysts about what kind of a relationship China ought to have with the DPRK. There is no love lost, right? These, these two countries really uh, have no, no natural affinity for each other, and this goes all the way back to perhaps the 1930s when uh, Kim um, may have been uh, ra rolled up with a, a, a gang of uh, pro-Japanese uh, guerrillas or the, the Ch Chinese communists believe were pro-Japanese guerrillas and also killed. But even in the Korean War, uh, Kim did not, uh, Kim, Kim's grandfather did not ask for Chinese assistance until October 1st, right? Until really it was way too late. Um, so there's no love lost between these two. Um, now, the upcoming uh, 19th Party Congress in China, this is the National Party Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, reinforcing my, my, my point earlier about uh, China's own legitimacy concerns, uh, is going to commence on the 18th of October. Uh, this is uh, an extremely important event in the Chinese political calendar. Uh, this is when we will see whether or not Xi Jinping has been able to consolidate uh, power by who is appointed and who is not appointed to the Politburo Standing Committee and how large that committee will be and so forth. But this political process, which reflects a year or two of negotiations behind the scenes, has induced a lot of caution in the Chinese system. So there is a chance that once Xi's position is more set, and I don't mean on October 19th, right? This would still take several months to play out, 
but if you had uh, a stronger, or if you had a consolidated leadership or, or more consolidated leadership in China, you might see a, a willingness to, to entertain greater action or perhaps even some kind of tacit cooperation diplomatically with the United States that has not yet uh, been pursued. I'm not holding my breath. But it could happen, and, and conditions would certainly be more ripe for that to happen after the 19th Party Congress. And then the debate that I mentioned, uh, where you have people, ironically enough, writing in Western media outlets. So one article appeared this summer in For Foreign Affairs by a Chinese scholar named Zhu Feng. Uh, entitled uh, something like uh, North Korea, China's Liability, basically suggesting that uh, China and the United States ought to uh, collaborate to figure out how to uh, deal with North Korea, which would be a huge change uh, uh, in China's approach. And then uh, about four weeks ago, Jia Qingguo, another uh, Beijing-based uh, Chinese scholar, published an article uh, in an Australian blog uh, calling for uh, joint China-US contingency planning. So these were remarkable articles. Uh, they could not be published in China. They were published outside of China, but immediately translated and recirculated within China, sparking a great debate. Uh, and these two individuals have faced, as far as I know, no repercussions for advancing these arguments that are certainly uh, on the face uh, contrary to the preferences and policies of the government uh, in Beijing. So there is a debate. Um, the last thing, I, how that unfolds, I don't know. But, but, but that's a sign that something could change. And then finally, I think uh, if you buy my, my, my assessment that China is, is quite concerned about the future of the Korean Peninsula, uh, the best hope if some sort of diplomatic uh, approach were pursued or some sort of joint US-Chinese approach were pursued would be to contain real assurances uh, about upholding uh, the division of the Korean Peninsula and securing uh, the regime uh, in Pyongyang, which I think many Americans would not want to do, and I don't think even this White House would want to do. But I think those are the kinds of assurances that China would be looking for if it were to apply uh, more pressure uh, to bring about change. Uh, the last uh, point I wanted to make is that I think, you know, if one thinks, uh, thinks uh, or looks forward to the, to the evolution of the region over the next five to 10 years, China's approach is, is probably backfiring quite considerably. So two outcomes are kind of possible. The first would be a tightening of the US alliance system uh, under the rubric of missile defense. We've already seen this with the deployment of a THAAD uh, battery uh, to South Korea earlier uh, this year. Uh, and we could certainly see a deployment of similar um, um, systems uh, to Japan or even a deepening uh, or enhancement of the systems that are in South Korea, uh, which not only enhance US missile defenses, but are a way in which uh, the US can greater integrate uh, the alliances in the region and integrate them together and be in a much stronger position than China wants. Or uh, South Korea and Japan could decide that they need to have their own nuclear weapons. Um, which is also what uh, Beijing uh, doesn't want. So in some ways, Beijing's reluctance to do more is, is creating uh, a set of futures that is actually harmful uh, to Beijing's uh, longer uh, term interests. But uh, that potential harm does not seem to outweigh uh, the imperatives uh, that uh, China has identified in keeping the peninsula divided. Thank you. Don, do you want me to? I guess they're supposed to go. Do you want to announce? Yes. So we're now in the question and answer period. We have microphones on either side of the aisles. People are free to line up behind them. We'd encourage one question per customer, hopefully a question rather than a lengthy statement. But that's probably as likely as Kim giving up his weapons. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, my name is Tung Hyun. I'm a second year master's student at the Fletcher School. So um, I re um, the an analysis made by Professor Narang, the de de from the denuclearization to the deterrence, I think it's a perfect policy goal change, um, more realistic at this point. Also, it's in, in, in a good standing with US vital interests in um, securing the survival of, survival of its allies. On the, other, on the other hand, I think the, another vital interest of the U.S. is to pre prevent the uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons, not only from the North Korea, but also in countries in East Asia, including South Korea and Japan. And I would argue that in South Korea, the nuclear fervor of South Korea going nuclear is pretty 
it's getting stronger and stronger. Um, if it's oppo opposition party with one third of uh, National Assembly seat, almost officially endorsed that South Korea should go nuclear. Is there or, a question here? Correct. So, so the question is, is U.S. willing to let South Korea or Japan go nuclear um, for the sake of for protecting, for continuing its deterrence policy against North Korea? I mean, these are old problems. We had to deal with this with West Germany in the 1950s um, and France in the 1950s and 60s. The strategic aim, also, I mean, there's a, there's a political aim that Kim Jong-un has with nuclear weapons also, which is break our alliances. And it's an old problem known as decoupling, which uh, you know r really confronted Western Europe when the Soviet Union was believed to be able to hold the U.S. homeland at risk. And De Gaulle famously asked, you know, would, would the United States trade Washington D.C. for Paris? And it was one of the reasons that motivated France to acquire nuclear weapons on its own. But Germany was also seized with this fear, and we we went to great lengths with nuclear sharing, dual key control, to prevent West Germany from going nuclear. And you know, it was the same kind of raising the temperature that Adenauer uh, did in order to get those assurances. So, you know, this is kind of a game that the Allies play also, which is they they raise the heat to get greater reassurance from the United States on extended deterrence. So this isn't an old problem, and we know how to do it. Now, it could be that President Trump has a more relaxed view of horizontal proliferation. We don't know. I don't. I mean, I, it would be a break in U.S. policy to say we are comfortable with the Allies acquiring nuclear weapons. There's a very real strategic reason why the United States doesn't want the Allies to acquire nuclear weapons, which is that they don't, the US doesn't want the Allies to start a war that the US has to finish, right? And having a single, a single finger on the button, so to speak, is much easier from an alliance management and nuclear command and control perspective. And I think that, that those are very strong arguments uh, you know, in favor of continuing extended deterrence. Extended deterrence is one of the greatest non-proliferation tools the United States has had. Uh, and I don't see, you know, Japan has you know, a very strong hedge already. Uh, and it's South Korea that I think has a longer way to go. And so we'll see how this un un unfolds. But I think Kim sits there seeing President Trump tweeting about chorus and South Korean appeasement thinking, my strategy is working. I'm breaking the alliances uh, and causing discord between Seoul and uh, Washington and Washington and Tokyo. And we have a very odd alliance structure, as you know. It's two bilateral relationships instead of a trilateral relationship. So uh, you know, we'll have to figure this out, but we know how to do this also. Uh, thank you. So I have a question about you know, the, the joint US-China plans. So it's not working? Yeah. Can, uh, Hello. There. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I have a question about the U.S.-China joint contingency plans. As Professor Fabio said that, you know, do you think you know under certain uh, circumstances, such that you know the U.S. and the China can work something, such that in return China agrees a unified Korean Peninsula, but is neutral and without U.S. military forces? Um, that might be China's aim in offering some sort of coordination, but I'm not sure that the United States and South Korea would agree, right? So um, I, I think the US concerns and even the South Korean concerns, and I think a growing awareness in China as well regarding coordination simply has to do with what happens uh, if there is a, a crisis or an event on the peninsula that require, that engages the interests of China and the United States at the same time. So in a regime collapse scenario, who secures uh, the North Korean nuclear materials, which are located pretty close to the border with China, uh, but the US still might be able to get there faster, right? Um, what happens if you have forces in close proximity to each other from both countries? So it has more to do with, I would say, operational or, or tactical questions than strategic questions as to what the future of the peninsula uh, should look like. But those tactical and operational concerns are getting uh, more and more important every day, especially if um, you believe that uh, Kim might be emboldened somehow with his possession of nuclear weapons uh, to initiate some kind of conventional provocation that then uh, elicits a U.S. and South Korean response. Can I just briefly add an addendum? Um, so I can understand, and I support it, that people want U.S. and China to work closely together. But as I said in my talk, this is exactly what North Korea fears and expects. And, and as we push China, understandably, to squeeze North Korea, uh, if that relationship deteriorates, 
Who is the great power guarantor for an agreement? Who is it that North Korea trusts when an agreement is signed to make sure the U.S. follows through on its promises? Now, the more China's, you know, China's in the classic situation of both trying to reassure and squeeze at the same time. But if that relationship unravels, uh, why in the world would North Korea ever agree to anything with the other parties? It's the weakest player. Um, should um, U.S. station nuclear weapons in North Korea like they do in Germany? In South Korea? In South Korea. No. Uh, there's no deterrent reason for it. I mean, we're the stronger conventional power, which is not the case in NATO, right? And so this argument about deploying tactical nuclear weapons in South Korea, I mean, they just they become ripe for inadvertent escalation. It's just more targets on the ground that, you know, that could, you know, we have, we have uh, sufficient standoff capability. We have, you know, SSBNs, a responsive air leg. There's just no reason I can conceive of from a deterrent standpoint as to why that would make sense, but I can think of a lot of downsides, right? Um, so I don't, I don't see the argument for it other than for reassurance, but there are other ways to reassure. It might signal to the North Koreans that the U.S. are really serious about I don't think the North Koreans are worried about our seriousness. Okay. I, I agree. <laughs> would it be better for, uh, I'm sorry, Bishop from Northeastern, um, would it be better for the international community to acknowledge North Korea's program and try to limit it where it is rather than allowing it to get in touch with other nuclear aspirants, given North Korea's past record with nuclear sharing with other states, potentially leaking information to Iran mm -hmm. and its missile program? That's a good, I, I, I mean, I've written this also. Giving, giving up on denuclearization does not mean you give up on nonproliferation. Nonproliferation objectives can occur and have arms control agreements with the Soviet Union and, and China have been reached while we're practicing deterrence, right? We're just, I'm just saying, give up on the dream of denuclearization, but that doesn't mean you can't work on vertical proliferation limits and horizontal proliferation. We're very worried about North Korea. The more sanctions you put on North Korea, the more incentive it has to sell nuclear technology and knowledge for hard cash. So we're, we obviously have interests in the in North Korean in preventing North Korean assistance of nuclear technology and knowledge to other countries, and we also have incentives to try to limit, you know, the vertical proliferation of the program also. And we can do that simultaneously. It's exactly what we do with the Soviet Union. Uh, and you know, India and Pakistan maybe one day can also have some discussion about vertical limits on, uh, on, their, on their programs also. But you know, there are things that I think North Korea signaled that we can even talk about now, even if we're not talking about negotiation, there are things that can be put on the table. B-1 flights in exchange for no more nuclear testing. B-1 flights in exchange for no more ICBM tests. I mean, there are, there's a lot of scope for you know, quid pro quos that don't involve give up your nuclear weapons, which seems to be our opening bid, at least publicly, and that's a non-starter for North Korea. I, I would say that the, in the policy world, the language here is important. I mean, uh, we had a, a, a Iran nuclear deal, but we never accepted the Iran, uh, Iran's self-described right to enrichment. And I think that we can negotiate with North Korea and reduce the risk, but I don't think, and obviously we accept the physical fact that they have nuclear capabilities, but I don't think we should welcome them as a nuclear weapon state. I didn't think we should have done that with India, and that's why I suppose the U.S.-India uh, nuclear deal, and I don't think we should do it in this case. But for some, that might seem too much parsing, but in the policy world, that, that stuff matters. They can't legally be a nuclear weapon state but because the NPT only identifies five, right? So they can be a nuclear weapons power without right. being a nuclear weapons state, which is kind of the language we use for India. I had a question about uh, U.S. Uh, left of launch strategy. There was some talk. Uh, U.S. Left of launch. Left, U.S. left of launch sabotage strategy. There was some talk about this uh, earlier in the year. It seems to have not been effective. Do you was see any it, evidence <laughs> working? Yeah. Was it ever working? And if so, why did it stop? It's a great psyop. I mean, I think you know, uh, Jim. Sorry. No, no. I, are you please. I mean, it, it's great to have these stories out there, right? Because it just generates fear in North Korea that we're messing with their supply chain and there's just no evidence is working. The missiles that have been failing are kind of the, the untested, unreliable Musadons which they you know, stitched together, but everything else seems to be working okay. And maybe we can get the supply chain, but they always have to worry about it. It's kind of the, you know, the instead of doing B-1 flights, one, you know, one, one possibility is we just release stories that we flew B-1 sorties and scare them with ghost sorties, right? I mean, all of that, all of the psychological operations are, are useful uh, but from uh, at least so far, 
it's hard to say that there's been any evidence it's worked. Now, it doesn't mean we aren't trying. It doesn't mean, I mean, there's, uh, there are a lot of things we can do to try and insert ourselves in the supply chain. But it gets back to the reason why, I don't know if you guys have been, you know, been following, there's a big debate about the provenance of the engines on the missiles and whether North Korea's front page New York Times story, whether North Korea can produce its own UDMH, the liquid fuel for the, the storable liquid fuel for the, the, 12, the Hwasong 12 and 14. Those are important because if they, we can mess with the supply chains if they have to get them from outside or if they're dependent on foreign suppliers. We can, you know, it, it limits the number, the amount of supply they have. If they can make it though, and they're doing it indigenously, they can have better ops, uh, operational security for it, and the limits on how big the program can grow are much higher then. And we may not be able to insert, insert you know, these kinds of left of launch uh, measures that we may be working on. Now we're going to continue to follow this process, but I do want to signal that since we do have uh, one of the world's leading scholars of nuclear issues in the room, if he doesn't want to get in line, he can still raise his hand and we'll entertain his question. Uh, yes, sir. Can you say that one more time? I know that mic is screwed up, and you're bending over. How would you consider the idea that the nuclear option is North Korea like free pass on humanitarian Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, I definitely hear, well, obviously it's a murderous regime uh, that is one of the worst with respect to the treatment of its own people, and oversaw a famine, uh, which it bungled. Uh, and so the, this moral question of how do you deal with evil when it's a threat and are you giving them a pass on that? Um, and I'm sympathetic to that. The humanitarian consequences of a nuclear war would be far more substantial. I think we need to put that on the ledger. And I don't think that just because we uh, entertain the possibility of having agreements that reduce the chance of conflict, that that requires that we're any less critical or work any harder on the humanitarian issues. When it comes to humanitarian relief, I would argue, the sanctions regime has made helping those women and children and uh, elderly in the in burnout cities and in the hinterlands more difficult. The Eugene Bell Foundation, because of national sanctions enacted by North Korea, was prevented for a while, until it was resolved, from going in to do tuberculosis work. You know, there's a lot of bad diseases, communicable diseases that you could have outbreaks in in North Korea. And so I don't, I, I don't see these things as mutually exclusive, but I, I get the, the notion that, hey, all we do is talk about nuclear, and that's the first priority, no one ever talks about the other stuff. I hear you, um, but I think there's more, uh, I, I think we can, it's not either or. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I'm Scott Sagan from Stanford. Uh, I don't hope you don't mind me jumping the queue, but these are former advisees of mine. So <laughs> it seems to me like it's your thesis advisor, even undergraduate honors advisor, may come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use this as precedent to come after these guys. <laughs> so, uh, like Jim, I'm worried about this, even though I think this is unlikely but war could occur. And one thing that I've been saying to people is, if the United States starts evacuating non-essential personnel, that's really what you should be really worried about. Can't. And then this weekend, Can't. there was an announcement that all American non-essential personnel should be prepared to evacuate. I did not see that. Within hours, it was released that this was false information. <laughs> yeah. This was not real in the US government issue something directly to the troops saying, don't believe this. Who possibly had an interest to do that? Thoughts? Worries? <laughs> Why would this have happened? So I wouldn't have done this 20 years ago when Scott was my advisor. I, I, I somewhat disagree on the evacuation order being a signal, because if it's going to be a surprise attack, we can't give, issue an evacuation order. And a surprise attack has to be the way we do this. And so my concern is actually the, we're putting American forces and personnel up on a platter if we start a war. And we wouldn't have any indicators because we can't give Kim any indication. And so I, I saw the, the, the story and it came from a South Korean outlet. I don't know what to make, you know, where it came from or why. 
But I immediately thought there's no way we would issue, because we just wouldn't issue an evac order in the first place. So my worry is war by miscalculation, the way I think the, all of us kind of see how it go, B-1 fly misinterpreted as go day. I would not expect an evacuation order. You know, I think they'll, oh, please go ahead. I was just saying, in all matters of fake news today, the Russians. <laughs> awesome. Good one, good one. Or the, yeah. I, 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 I'm not so confident and sanguine uh, about it, but I, I think what it does is point to this, we now have another path to war that we did not have before, uh, which is, for lack of a better term, fake news and manipulation of, of reporting. And I think that's very disturbing. And we know that certain leaders of the world pay more attention to news reports than they do to their advisors. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I mean, uh, or their intelligence the community, about or the their Iran missile test, which was not. Yes. Real. So I think that this is another path. You know, I I would say, you know, we're one dead fish. I used to say we're one dead fisherman from some sort of conflict. Uh, that is to say, what is the thing that we're not looking for that leads people to, you know, misinterpret? And you and I have not thought about this before, and you have now identified a whole new category. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, it appears, um, whether it's reality or not, but that uh, North Korea is extremely paranoid um, that they're going to be invaded, et cetera, or, I mean, whether or not that's just this, Kim is what he's selling that to his people t to remain in power. Um, do you think that, uh, although we would have to have diplomatic relations, which we don't currently have with them, but if we ever offered to end the armistice in an official peace treaty, uh, and formalize it, that might give him sort of a, you know, olive branch to grab and say, this is what I did for America and we can actually have some real negotiations or do you think it wouldn't even make a difference? For years and years and years in Trek 2, that is what the North Koreans have been asking for, is a peace treaty. Uh, and there's any number of uh, Americans who served officially in government who opposed it when they were in government and then endorsed it once they got out of government. I can think of at least three. Um, I, yeah, I think it's worth pursuing. It's, you know, I think, I, I think people should just show up at the table without precondition. That's how you do negotiations. Right now, both sides are saying, I want to talk, I don't want to talk. And both, and in our case, we're saying, we want you to denuclearize as evidence of your good faith before we sit down to talk about your denuclearization. So I don't know why you'd have the negotiation if they had already done what you asked for them for to begin with. But my own view is we, parties just need to sit down. They need to show up every Wednesday in Geneva and sit, and, if, and each, every party gets to say what they want to say, and they keep doing it, and, uh, and, and then you see where it goes. And peace treaties should certainly be part of that, but I don't sense there's the same, that, that, that has the same salience or juice that it had in past years. And of course, peace treaty means very different things to, to the parties. And when you say that, you mean Yeah, the North Koreans, uh, we always sort of rejected it out of hand, which I always thought was a dumb idea. Uh, uh, but the North Koreans, they still talk about it, but they don't talk about it as much. They talk a lot more about Bingen policy of we're, in a, we're in a, uh, a weapon state and we're going to develop our economy. But I would love, I'd be happy to bring that back as an oldie but goodie. I clearly understand the reasons that you all mentioned for why they uh, why they rationally want nuclear weapons, but wasn't it sufficient to have the conventional deterrent? Great question. With proximity to Seoul and to yes. the, 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 the terrain with the hardening and the hiding of armaments. And I'm just wondering why they didn't stay on that path. Spectacular question. <laughs> Fantastic question. And I think that's a real puzzle. Um, and I don't know the answer. I mean, it could be that there are other motivations for the nuclear program. Some people thought it was their new look. They couldn't afford to maintain a conventional, so they went nuclear. Some people think it's about you know, uh, le internal legitimacy and prestige. I don't know, but I think uh, you know, uh, maybe it isn't as good as we think, but they seem to have worked really hard on that too. But I, I love the question, and I have no idea. Do you guys have a crack at this? I think those are all what, what Jim said. There are not mutually exclusive reasons. But there, I mean, I still think there, there's a security argument, which is if you're North Korean, you believe that the U.S. is willing to sacrifice Seoul anyway, how do you change the U.S. calculation? Mm -hmm. If you want to break the alliances, then you, know, you don't have the conventional reach to really hurt the U.S. without nuclear weapons. I think that's kind of the, that would be the, mm -hmm. the security-ish argument. 
But you know, it's true. I mean, we're still talking. You know, it's we're still talking about a population of 20 million people within 37, 30, 40 miles of the DMZ. And you know, you're know you going to have significant casualties even without a nuclear weapon, which, you know, the South Korea's been living with this conventional deterrent for so long. So North Korea's nuclear weapons actually don't affect South Korea as much as it affects Japan and the United States. And I think we're seeing that. You know, I think there's a little more, you know, the South Koreans say, we this doesn't really change, you know, our political strategy with North Korea. It changes yours. And But I think that kind of division between the alliance is exactly what Kim is trying to achieve in developing nuclear weapons also. But there's a very strong political argument here, which is break these alliances apart. The final point I would add is I, I do think, I can't prove this, but my intuition is that there's something to do with domestic political legitimacy sure. as well, yeah. right? I mean, so many pictures of Kim uh, standing uh, uh, and observing a test and exercise, smoking around a missile uh, launch before it was launched, that, that he seems to be using that. It could be a second order reason, not a first order reason. I think the ones that Vip mentioned probably the primary ones, but he could certainly be using it uh, to bolster what looked like a pretty weak position when he came into power, along with you know shooting his uncle and a bunch of other people. Now, are we supposed to wrap up soon? Yes. One more one, question. One question. I'm going to ask that the line be broken, because we haven't had one female questioner the entire time, and I'm going to give that question to you. So I'm from Brooklyn High School, and I want to ask about the role that the international bodies, such as United Nations, can play to to solve the North Korean problem. And is there any resemblance of North Korean North Korean case to the cases of like Iran or Pakistan? Well, I think it's a good question. You know, we've seen in the news recently that the Europeans, so, you know, what are our other al diplomatic alternatives or people who could be conveners or, or help nudge the parties along? The Europeans are actively trying to do that, according to some recent reporting based on the embassies in Pyongyang. You know, uh, certainly the UN is involved in humanitarian assistance in uh, the DPRK, but also they're involved in these human rights uh, investigations which drive the North Koreans crazy, absolutely crazy. And it's the UN that has imposed all these sanctions. Um, so as a neutral interlocutor, uh, it's, it's tough. And of course, what is the UN? It's a membership of sovereign states. So I totally get the idea that it would be nice to have some, uh, some other way to get at this. And, I, uh, and so we need to think creatively about that. And so that's part of that process, is to think about what the UN or what others might do. But at the end of the day, the principles will, uh, if others can clear the ground or provide encouragement, the principles are still going to have to make some tough decisions themselves. But that's a great question. Just the last thing to add on the UN, with, with China and Russia both on the Security Council and exercising a veto, right, it quickly surfaces the political calculations of the five permanent members. And if they are not in agreement as to how to proceed, then I think it limits uh, what the Security Council can do. Now, there are other, other UN bodies playing other roles, but um, in terms of the Security Council, we can't remember it really as a reflection of the politics of the permanent members. Boss, do you want to take us out here? So oh, one more? Sure, we get one more. This is your bonus question. Look at how fast that guy. You're good. He's hey, this is a question about North Korea's deterrent strategy. Uh, given the uh, potential impact of uh, an EMP strike on the U.S. power grid, do you think that's part of their nuclear deterrent strategy? I just don't know why you'd waste a nuclear weapon on an EMP. I, I mean, if you're going to target the U.S. homeland, you target the U.S. homeland. I mean, the the EMP concern right now, I think, is this discussion of a, an atmospheric nuclear test. And if you do that over the Pacific, mm -hmm. There will be EMP effects around, like within a certain radius, depending on the yield. And shipping, an air, we, I don't know how civilian airliners are hardened against an EMP. I mean, we don't know. And you know, they, the, right now, I think the immediate threat is if they if they go forward with an atmospheric nuclear test on a ballistic missile, which they've signaled they're considering. But I, I would be surprised if they if that's our leadoff hitter. I think there's we'd have to there'd have to be an escalation of the crisis, or we have to keep saying we don't. We don't believe you have the ability to deliver a thermonuclear weapon on the Hwasong-14. And that's what drove the Chinese to do 
the Chick 4 test in, 60, in 1966. It's why the Navy tested Frigate Bird in 66 because it was to show the, or 62, to show the Air Force that they could do it. And so if we keep saying we doubt the North Korean ability to deliver a warhead the way the State Department spokesman said the other day, they may just show us that they can do it. And then, you know, if a missile goes awry, I mean, the, how do you clear out? They probably can't give advance warning. Things have to be, they'd have to do it without a lot of notification to airmen or mariners. And so you could, mariners, so you probably have, you could have some effect on shipping and civilian airliners. That, I think, could be a very significant pathway. If a civilian airliner goes down, I don't know enough about how hardened civilian airliners are against you know, a, a high altitude EMP uh, effect, but that would be very, very, very risky. I, I have a big bias. I, am, I, am, uh, I never got the EMP thing. It seemed to me that you got, uh, Certainly not in the U.S. homeland. I mean, that's well, a you get you get all the uh, downsides of a nuclear attack without any of the benefits, right? Your adversary sees this nuclear missile coming towards you. They don't know that it's in an EMP, and they think, oh, we're under attack. So you know, we're going to shoot our nuclear missiles at you. Mm -hmm. I, so I'm I, I've never really gotten gotten that one. So but what is an EMP? Uh, like, pulse. Yeah, so you, you launch a nuke, you put it in the atmosphere, and it <laughs> fries the electrical grid. But I know people care about it, so and that's good no, too. I mean, it's certainly not on the U.S. I mean, the the only scenario I think that that is a risk is with the test over the mm -hmm. Pacific, the way that you know yep. that would then you have localized yes. EMP effects. Do you see that as that? less of a threat than say a direct nuclear attack? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to use. <laughs> Yes. If you're North Korea, you're going to use one, you use right. one. Right. If you, you're all in or you're not. This halfway thing only gets you killed without accomplishing right. any of your goals. <laughs> Let's thank our panel. And thank you.